action. Woo! All right, let's start clapping. Everyone who longs for truth, we need hope and strength renewed. Come and meet the Savior of the world. Everyone who longs inside, desperate for the words of life, come and meet the Savior of your
All right. How are we all doing this morning? Yes. Some of you are excited. That's nice. Others of you are just waking up. Welcome. Good morning. Others of you will wake up in just a few minutes. All right. Great to have you guys here. Merry Christmas. Hey, it's coming, people. It's coming. What are we? What are we? About two weeks away. It's about two weeks away from Christmas. Right at about two weeks. You got two weeks to get your Christmas shopping done. Yes. Well, this morning we're going to do a couple of familiar, we're going to do a familiar Christmas song. This one's not, maybe not so familiar, brand new last year, uh, but it just speaks about who he was and what he did and this baby, this hope, this gift that was given to us was given at a season and a time to change the world. And this song speaks about who he is and what he did and the fact that he came and he's Emmanuel, which means God with us. And he sees your struggles. He knows the fears and he knows the pains of life. And he's always with us. And so this song speaks about Noel. If you know it, sing it with us. If you don't, you'll pick up on it. It's a pretty easy song. It just speaks about our incredible Savior, Noel. Love incarnate, love divine Star and angels gave the sign Bow to babe on bended knee The Savior of humanity Unto us a child is born He shall reign forevermore The 
That name speaks hope. That name speaks life. For unto us a child is born, a Savior is given. Today, born unto you in the city of Bethlehem is Emmanuel, God with us. You will find a babe wrapped in clothes and he will be the Savior of the world. He is Noel. He is the one who brings hope. He is the one who brings life. He is the one who looks down in the most hopeless of circumstances and can breathe life into them. He is truly Emmanuel, God with us. Today, God, we thank you for your great gift, your son, Jesus, that during this time of year is, is not just a moment to reflect on him, it's a moment to celebrate all that he does throughout the year in our lives. For without him, we are hopeless, and without him, we are unchanged. Without him, we have zero possibility of making it through tomorrow. But with him, we are full of life, and with him, we are full of peace, and with him, we are full of joy. It's why we can sing joy to the world. It's why we can sing in the middle of circumstances that are so tough. In life when we lose, in life when we, we have heartbreaks, life whenever we face pain you are our hope you are our strength you are Noel because of that today we can find peace in you because of that today we can find hope in who you are so God I pray for those today who hearts are discouraged hearts that are in pain today May they find your peace. May they find your presence. Thank you, God. The first Noel The angels did say Was to certain poor shepherds in fields where they lay in fields where they lay keeping their sheep on a cold winter's night that was so deep nowhere nowhere Noel, Noel, born is the King of Israel. They look it up and saw a bright star shining in.
Father God, this morning, thank you for sending Jesus. Can we just thank him for sending his son right now? Right there where you're at in your own way, can you just thank God for sending for sending his son, Jesus Christ? Thank you for sending the Savior of the world. Thank you for giving the greatest sacrifice, the greatest gift that has ever been known to man. Today we stand here in this place because of a result of him. Today we stand here with hope in our chest. We stand here with happiness all around us. We stand here today with a sense of peace that in the middle of chaos, you bring us peace. We stand here today knowing that you are Emmanuel, God with us. So God, no matter what this Christmas season holds, no matter what the past Christmas seasons brought, no matter what the future may bring our way, we know this, you will always be with us, you will always walk with us, you will always speak to us, and you will be our ever-present help in times of trouble. Whether we lose or whether we win, you are always there. Whether we have plenty or we're in want, you're always there. Whether, God, we are victorious or we are defeated, we stand with you victorious every day because of what you did. So thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Jesus, for living. Thank you for giving your life. May this Christmas season truly be one where we reflect in thanks for who you are. Let me sing it again. No way. Noel, Noel, born is the King of Israel. Noel, 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 born is the King. Thank you, God, for giving your son, and thank you, Jesus, for your great gift. We continue to speak to our hearts and our lives today. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. series called Ghost of Christmas Past, where we've been discovering uh, the challenges with ghosts and how they haunt us uh, in life. Now, I know some of you may think, well, this really should have been done around Halloween time, talking about ghosts, you know. Why are we talking about ghosts at Christmas time? And, and I got to be honest with you, whenever I was preparing and thinking about this message in this, these three weeks, uh, it wasn't really something I was sold out on. I wasn't like completely enthusiastic about preaching these and speaking these messages because quite honestly, they're not the fun Christmas story. You know, the fun Christmas story uh, talks about a baby born in a manger and talks about, you know, some shepherds coming and, sh and, and experiencing the joy and talks about, you know, Mary pondering these things in their hearts. And, you know, it talks about the good things of Christmas. And quite honestly, we haven't really talked about that. I know what you're all thinking. When's he going to get into the Christmas story? And, and so I really struggled with sharing this type of message or these kind of topics that we're talking about. But then as I prayed and I thought more about them, I, it, I found out that in order for us to experience the fullness of Christmas, in order for us to really enjoy Christmas, we need to deal with some ghosts that haunt us in our past. In order for us to enjoy family and enjoy the, the festivities of the day, we need to deal with some of the things that have haunted us in our past. 
I talked about the first week, remember I talked about the ghost of offense, that sometimes we get our feelings hurt by family members. Um, you all know who they are. You know, you know the aunt and uncle that says, hey, look at you. You put a few pounds on. Oh boy, hope you don't eat too much. You don't need it. Fatty? I mean, they didn't say that, but that's what they said without saying it. You know what I'm talking about? You know all those aunts and uncles, and none of you had that? Okay, you're probably the one saying it then. That's probably really what it is. Uh, you know, it, it, it may be something like that, but, you know, so we carry offenses, either small offenses or big offenses. Some big offenses are things that really have hurt. Um, it could be something that was done to you or something that was said to you that cut really, really deep. And uh, so first week, we talked about how to uh, deal with the ghost of offense uh, so if you weren't here, that was a couple weeks ago. It's online at uh, crossviewkeokuk.com. Uh, you can watch it in video or listen to it through, uh, through any of your podcasts or Google Play. Uh, lots of different ways for you to do that. Um, and then last week, I talked about one that we all kind of relate to, and that's the ghost of shame. Um, remember what I said last week? I said shame is one of those things that that really haunts us and really paralyzes us from moving forward, from things we've done in our past, things we've said in our past, and shame kind of kind of paralyzes us and won't let us, won't let us move forward. And, and I, I, incur, I said this, I said guilt, when we are guilty, guilt says, I did something wrong. It makes an event, it makes an occurrence in time, like boom, it happened, and now we move on. But shame says, I am bad. So I did bad versus I am bad. And, uh, and shame paralyzes us from moving forward to what God wants. And I challenged you last week of how to overcome that shame and how to move into healthier places. Uh, today, we're going to deal, deal with something that I know I said this about every week, but really has been kind of a culmination, building one on another. This is going to be the best week for you guys to be here. Because this is, quite honestly, probably the hardest topic to talk about. Because, here's why, if you don't deal with offenses, and if you don't deal with shame, you will wind up being the person I'm going to talk about today. And every, when I preach today, here's what's going to happen. Here's what's going to happen. You're either going to say, that's me, or you're going to point to 100 other people, that's them. Because today's topic deals with a subject that very much haunts and we're affected by, all of us are affected by today's subject. Stand your feet. I'll tell you what it is in a minute. Stand your feet. Let's do our Bible prayer. It says this, I hold the hope of the world, the blueprint for life. I will read it, study it, share it. God, help me to understand it, apply it, and live it in Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen. here we go. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14 says this one. It says, make every effort to live what? In peace with all people uh, and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. It goes on to say, next verse, it says, see to it that no one misses the grace of God. And that what? No what? Bitter. Say it again. What is it? Bitter. Bitter root grows up and cause trouble and defile many. It means uh, make sure the root doesn't start in you and affect others around you. All right, let's pray. God, help us today to hear from your word, but more than anything, be changed by it. God, I pray, Holy Spirit, let something penetrate our hearts. Just one thing, Holy Spirit, that we'll take away today, that will resonate in our hearts this season, in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. Today, I want to talk to you about the ghost of bitterness, the ghost of bitterness, this is one that literally is probably the, the strongest of all the ghosts. If ghosts had strength, he would be the strongest. He'd be the Hercules of ghosts, if you will. Uh, a fits, okay, he's okay. He's, he's, he's hurtful, but we'll work with it. Shame, we can kind of move through it. But the ghost of bitterness is the one that takes all the shame, takes all the offenses, takes all the wrongs, and just piles them down. And all of a sudden, we find ourselves being people who are full of bitterness. Bitterness is not only a poison that will poison you, but bitterness is a poison that will poison all those around you. Bitterness is something that can literally be transferred from person to person if not careful. Two biblical thoughts about bitterness today. Fine, if you would, write these down in your notes. First one is this. Bitterness has a dangerous root. What is a root? The Bible says this. It says, see to it that no bitter root grows up in your heart that it may defile many. What is a root? Well, a root is the beginning place of any plant that grows. 
If it does not have roots, it will not grow. And bitterness has a dangerous root. It grows deep in the soil of pain. It grows in the soil of hurt. It grows in the soil of I was wronged. And the bitter roots dig deep. And they soak up every bit of resentment. They soak up anger. They soak up all the pain. All the agony is absorbed into the root system of bitterness because bitterness has a dangerous root. The Bible says love keeps no record of wrong. Bitterness keeps a detailed tally. Love overlooks offenses. Bitterness holds on to every bit of offenses. Love does not remember things that were said in error. Bitterness records every one of them, and they're ready for quick replay at any time. Bitterness keeps a detailed tally. It has a dangerous root. And because it has a dangerous root, number two, bitterness produces a poisonous fruit. Bitterness has a dangerous root, and it produces a poisonous fruit. It says this, it says, wherever uh, uh, New Living Translation says this in uh, Hebrews 12, 15, it says, whenever the bitter root springs up, what does it say? Many are corrupted. All right, people, you all need to wake up today, and you need to help me read. Y'all can't just sit back and not help me now. I know it hurts. I know it hurts to read it, but read it along with me. Here we go. It says, whenever the bitter root springs up, many are corrupted by its poison. The fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control, and gentleness. These are the fruits of the Spirit. But the fruits of bitterness are far different than the fruits of the Spirit. The fruits of bitterness are things that, that creep up inside of us that we never really thought were there. And then all of a sudden, something happens and ba bam, baby, there's a fruit that comes out. Have you, have you ever noticed when bitter people come around how the atmosphere can change? Have you ever noticed in your workplace that person that you just can't stand being around because you know doggy downer is coming, baby. It's going to be a down day because they are bitter. I mean, these are people that they're negative about everything. They're critical about everyone. It doesn't matter how well you perform. It doesn't matter how well you do. Your boss never recognizes you. And therefore, so many times what happens is, is we, get, we get around these bitter people and they rub off on us. Christmas time is going to happen. Uncle Bitterness is going to walk in. Aunt Bitterness is going to show up. And you're going to sit across from them at the dinner table. And you're going to want to whack them with a turkey leg. Because they just are so bitter. They're bitter at life. I mean, everything is down. Everything. Now, now here's the deal. Some of you, you're already thinking about who they are. Others of you can't think of anybody because you're it. Mm-hmm. Preach it now. Say, teens, I see it all the time. Teenagers so dramafied, so dramatic with bitterness. Oh, yeah, she is, and he is, and they do, and they don't, and all this stuff. I mean, it's just all around us, this bitterness. This bitter root produces bit poisonous fruit. So how do we know? How do we know if we're a bitter person, or how do we know we're around bitter people? Five qualities of bitter people. Here we go. Write this down. Some of you need to be writing this stuff down. This is good stuff. You're going to need this come, uh, come Christmas time with your family. Michelle, will you give me napkins? I just tapped that and threw my water everywhere. So I'll take a drink while you're doing that. All right. First quality is this. Bitter people justify their bitterness. You meet these people. You could have the same experience as them, and guess what? Theirs is worse. You know what I'm saying? The one-uppers. I mean, you could be picked on by the same bully, but guess what? They had it worse than you did. 
Their upbringing was worse than you. Was it that much? Um, it's a lot, and this is the last one. All right, I got it. That's okay. I got it. You're okay. No, now we're spilling it everywhere. Okay, you're good. Go on down. Just go on down. Thank you. <laughs> Don't get bitter at me now, Michelle. Don't get bitter at me. It's justified. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what they all say, honey. That's what they all say. They all say that. Bitter people justify I'm different because I deserved better than you. Bitter people always justify their bitterness. Second quality is this. Bitter people uh, tend to become overly critical of others. Bitter people tend to always view people under very critical eye. Because they may not be able to measure up, they have to make sure that you can't measure up. Bitter people judge with a critical eye. Here's how it happens. Here's how it plays out. Girls, ladies, that lady walks in the room and you give them the once up and down, baby. Hmm, she's trashy. She's nasty. Yeah, you all know I'm talking. Some of you, are, you know what you do. I'm the only preaching truth here. Guys, we do it too. You know, we'll look a guy, we'll look a guy, we're like, yeah, I got more muscles than him. I'm bigger than him. I'm better looking than him. You know, we all do it. Oh, I make more money. Guys more about, you know, I make more money than him. I got, I got, I drive a better car than they do. We, we become critical of others if we are bitter people. Third thing is bitter people uh, are secretly celebrating the misfortunes of others. They rejoice when people fail. They get happy whenever someone else falls or, or makes a mistake and they're publicly humiliated. They celebrate the fact that their kids didn't quite perform at the level that they should have. They celebrate the misfortunes of others bitter people do. Fourth thing is this, bitter people tend to write off entire groups of people. Well, I don't want to go to that restaurant because there was a waitress that said something to me or treated me wrong, and so I'm never going back there again. Or I can't go to that doctor's office because they didn't diagnose me the way I wanted them to, so I'm not going back there again. Or men will write off entire groups of women and women entire groups and genders of men. Here's how it plays out in the church. People write off church. People write off pastors. Well, I don't trust pastors. They're all crooks anyway. Or I don't want to go to that church because um, they didn't quite welcome me the way that I think they should have. And so they write off entire groups of people. And number five, here's the fifth one. So justify their bitterness, become overly critical, secretly celebrate the misfortunes of others, write off entire groups of people. The last one is this. Um, People who are bitter struggle to see the bitterness in the mirror. I bet if I went around the room and I asked people face to face, are you a bitter person? You know what you would say? No, no, I'm pretty, I'm pretty good. I'm, I'm pretty good. Now, some of you may be honest enough to say, yeah, I'm pretty bitter. But others of you, most of you would be like, no, I'm not a bitter person. But here's the thing. Let me take a survey of the people you work with and the people you live with and see what they say about you. Now, that may be a different story. They may have a totally different thing to say about you. Why? Because bitterness cannot be seen in a mirror. You have people tell you, hey, you know, you're kind of grumpy today. You're kind of, why are you so tense today? And, and you're like, I'm not tense. Well, you're tense. Why are you so tense? There's your sign. You're probably a better person. Probably got some issues. Bitter people cannot see it in the mirror. So what happens is it plays out. Promote, you're looked, overlooked by promotions, and you're just doing your job, just trying to make things happen. But deep down inside, you're outwardly agreeable, inwardly resentful, and bitter. And you stuff it down, and you stuff it down, and you stuff it down until one day you're on the cover of the newspaper because you went in and punched somebody in the face. <laughs> right? Because bitterness, you cannot really see. It, it, it has a... Has a 
dangerous root that produces poisonous fruit. Maybe it's parents. Uh, parents, you know, maybe you look at your parents as not being ideal, and so you become bitter them, or siblings not being perfect in you, so you look at them not being ideal, and so you get bitter because maybe they had some different things in their life that they had to deal with, and you felt it unfair. Maybe you had somebody take advantage of you. Maybe in a, in a marriage, there's been, there's been wrongs happen inside of a spouse, between the two spouses, and, and, and maybe there's resentment between each other, and so you become bitter and you become angry and resentful. Divorce situations. Maybe, here's a big one. Here's just a very, very, very big one that we, we oftentimes will justify this one more than anything, and that is when someone hurts our kids, we feel it validated and valued that we can step up and get bitter towards people. Guys, I'm here to tell you, there's no room for it because the problem is, is sometimes what we've done, I'm just going to get a soapbox. We have protected our kids so much from things said and things done to them. They are so weak. Amen. Let me just say something. I understand that sometimes there is unfair, unjust things done and said to kids. I get it. But parent, mom, and dad, it's not your role to go up to the school system and lay into everybody that says it. And yet, you can let so much stuff go by. Do I believe there's a time that you do that? Yep, I had to deal with it this week. I had to go take care of things that I didn't want to deal, but I had put up with stuff for so long that I'm like, okay, let's have a conversation. But I did not go up in a brutal way. I went in a very, I feel I'm going in a Christ-like way of saying, listen, can we get the full picture here? Let's find out what's going on. I love our teachers. Can we just let our teachers know how much we love them? Can we just let them know? I have a lot of teachers in here. I love our teachers. And let me tell you something. They don't get paid enough to deal with the junk that they have to deal with every day with your child. They don't. And I know you all think my kid's perfect, but can I tell you they're not? Neither is my son or my daughter. My whole life, this is not even what I'm preaching about, but my whole, my whole upbringing are for my kids. I have, I have done my best to pull my kids out of the spotlight and try to let them be teenagers just like your kids and not be in the fishbowl effect um, because I don't want them to be there. My son's not perfect. My daughter's not perfect. I'm not perfect. Michelle's not perfect. You're not perfect. Your kids aren't perfect. None of us are perfect. If we just get used to that, if we're just okay with that, we'll give each other lots of grace, right? So whenever something happens to one of our children, instead of celebrating, instead of going, oh my gosh, instead of that, you know what we do? We step up and say, how can we help you? How can we be there for you through this time? Bitterness has a dangerous root, produces a poisonous fruit. Bitter people justify their bitterness, become overly critical, secretly celebrate the misfortunes of others, write off entire groups of people and struggle to see bitterness in the mirror. You don't know if you're a bitter person or not. Here, a uh, bitter person or not. Here's, here's what I'll tell you. Um, if it's safe, ask your spouse if that's a safe place to do it. Or ask a very close friend that you trust. Am I a bitter person? Do I come across bitter? In a moment, I'm going to tell you the fruits of bitterness. In a moment, I'm going to read you a scripture that's going to tell you what bitterness comes out like. And then you may be able to tell. How do we kill the root of bitterness? We kill the root of bitterness by forgiveness. Bitterness is only killed by forgiveness. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31, 32. Here's what, here's what bitterness produces. Here's the fruit of bitterness. Get rid of all bitterness. It produces rage. It produces anger. It produces brawling and slander. And it produces malice, hatred, in your heart. Bitterness, if not dealt with, you will see people that are, if they're, if, they're, if they're bitter, if they're dealing with bitterness, they'll be raging, they'll be angry, they'll want to brawl, they'll want to slander, and they will have hatred in their heart towards people. These are bitter people. These are their fruits, the poisonous fruits of bitterness. But it goes on to say this in verse 32. It says, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, giving room for grace, just as Christ forgave you. See, bitterness takes us to a place and produces, instead of love, it produces hate. Instead of, of peace, it produces rage and chaos. Bitterness, we can carry with us for years. 
and never recognize it. It's the strongest ghost in our lives. And it haunts us and it torments us and it taunts us because he knows if I can keep them here, they'll never get healed. Story of two monks goes like this. Story of two monks that made a vow uh, early on in their monkhood. And they said this. They said, we are vowing between each other that we will never touch a woman. Because if we touch a woman, we might fall into temptation, and that temptation may pull us away from our calling. So we, as, uh, we will never touch a woman our whole life. As they went through the years, they kept this commitment. They were very faithful to it. <clears throat> One day, both monks were on a journey, and they hear this cry off in the distance, help, help. And they start to look around for where it's coming from, and they walk quite a distance, and all of a sudden, they find where it's coming from, and there's a, there's a river in front of them, a rushing river. And on the other side is a woman, a fair maiden, that needs rescuing. And both monks knew their commitment to each other, and they said, well, we, we can't, what can we do? Can we throw a rope? Can we, you know, what can, can we, you know, we can, what, what can we do to help her? And, and they discussed it for quite a while. She's over there going, help, help me, help. And they find, one of the monks finally says, you know what? I'm going to go across there. I'm going to carry her over here and get her on this ground and, and, and get her on her path. And the, 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 the monk was like, what? No, 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 wait, wait. You can't. You committed your whole life to never touch a woman. How? You're not just going to touch her. You're going to carry her. You cannot do that. And he said, listen, the, the monk that wanted to do it said, listen, the Christ-like thing to do is to save her rather than leave her there. We can't just leave her there. I'm going to go do this. So he goes across the water. He picks her up. He brings her back. He sets her down. She goes about her way. And the other monk just sat there and was like, what? I cannot believe that you just touched a woman. I, I, all these years we committed to it. And here you go. And you break this vow that we have. How dare you touch a woman? And the monk said, that was the right thing to do. I'm, I'm not going to feel bad for it. That was the right thing to do. I'm fine. I'm moving on. Next day they wake up and the, the monk says, I cannot believe you touched that woman. That is a, you broke everything we stood for. How dare you? And the monk said, hey, hey, you know, it's okay. I'm, I'm, I'm fine. Let's move on. Let's get past it. Three days pass. Their day rolls around and the monk wakes up and says, I still can't believe you touched that woman. How dare you touch that woman? I'm appalled at the whole thing. Finally, the monk had enough. And he said, listen, I set that woman down three days ago, and you're still carrying her in your heart. When are you going to put her down? Bitterness has a way of carrying something for a long time and never putting it down. The one monk that saved her moved on, but the other one was paralyzed by bitterness in his heart. I don't know how it plays out in your life, but so many times this bitterness can, can find a way to come out in ways that you don't think it's really what it is. I, I've known of people that, that they, didn't, they were unaware of how much pain they really were in until I saw the results and the fruits in their life. They were rageful. They were angry. They were resentful. They were people that, I mean, you know, I mean, they, you know that battery drops, and they're like, ah, battery drops. You know these people? Just everything sets them off. And I always go to what pain is inside of them that's being absorbed by the roots that's producing the poisonous fruit. So much of my life has, uh, when I was young, I had rage issues. I had anger issues. I'm not saying I'm the most calm guy in the world. I can get pushed. 
But I will say that I think my wife and my kids can test. I'm not a rageful person. I don't walk around angry. I don't walk around bitter just looking for anything to fall off. I watched my dad throughout his life struggle with anger and struggle with his temper. In fact, many a times I remember vividly my dad bringing our family in church and coming down to the altar. And I remember him praying so much, God, calm my temper. Deal with this ghost in my life. And through that example, I learned the only way I can deal with the ghost in my past is to deal with the Holy Spirit moving the ghost out. How do I forgive? How do I let things go? How do we move past this bitterness? Ephesians 4.32 says we forgive because we've been forgiven. We must forgive others. I realize we have to acknowledge that we've been hurt. We acknowledge the pain, but we don't absorb it. I realize that some of you today, you have been abused verbally. Some of you today have been abused physically. Some of you have been abused emotionally. Some of you have been abused sexually. I realize that that brings so much bitterness and so much pain. But I also know that God is a God of healing and God is a God of miracles and that God can take you on a journey, though it may be long and it may be painful. He can take that root of bitterness and rip it out and replace it with the fruit of the spirit. What do we need? We need a spiritual cleansing. What do we need? We need a spiritual healing. What do we need? We need to surrender to the one who takes care of the garden. The one who walks through and he sees the poisonous fruit and he begins to dig up the dangerous root and replaces it with his spirit. And why is it important? Matthew tells us why it's important. Matthew 6, 14 says it this way. It says, for if you forgive men when they sin against you, if you forgive women when they sin against you, if you forgive mom and dad and brother and sister and family member and friends and aunts and uncles and, and, and those that maybe weren't even part of your life, if you forgive, for if you forgive, what is the key word? What is the key word? If, if we forgive, if it is all contingent on you. If we forgive those who sin against us, then our Heavenly Father will also forgive us. What's at stake here? What's at stake here is, will you be forgiven or not? Now, I realize that some of you are saying, you don't even know how hard it is to forgive. You don't know what I have been through to forgive. I don't need to go into details about my life and about the struggles that I have been through, but I can guarantee you this right now. I have not had a perfect upbringing. I've had to deal with pain of my own in the past. I've had to look to the ugliness of my bitterness, and I've had to ask God to forgive me. I've had to forgive people that have wronged me in ways that are embarrassing to talk about, but I have done it because I want to be forgiven. Therefore, I will initiate forgiveness. Did it happen overnight? Nope. Did it take years? Yep. And guess what? Still some days, still working on me. Because I don't want the dangerous root to produce the poisonous fruit of bitterness. Bow your heads with me this morning. Father God, we come up for you right now. This is not an easy subject to talk about, God. It's not, it's not easy to, to speak about such things that cut us so deep and hurt us so greatly. But God, this is an area that you want to deal with, a ghost that haunts us, a ghost that paralyzes, a, go a ghost that tries to keep us where we're at. And I pray that God, right here in the moment and time that we have, in the quietness and stillness of this moment, may you speak to hearts 
May you speak to those who have been hurt in the past that, there's, that the soil has absorbed the root around it and that has produced a poisonous fruit. God, there's some here today I know that, that they've carried this pain with them for years. There's some here today that have, have walked around with such deep sorrow in their hearts that they don't even know why. And yet, God, the fruit comes out, the anger, the rage, the malice, the hatred, uh, the resentment is all right there because, God, they've never fully dealt with whatever event took place in their life. So, God, I pray today through this next few moments of time that, Holy Spirit, you would do a supernatural cleansing, that you would, do a, you would bring it to a moment where people would feel your presence right here, right now. And God, for those who are hurting, for those who are struggling, for those who are suffering because of their past and the bitterness that resides inside them, God, how I pray, be the comfort, Holy Spirit, that they need even now. Be, be the source of strength that they need right now, God. Because, Lord, bitterness creeps up and we can't even see it, and yet it's right there. So, God, I pray right now, move upon your people. With your head bowed and eyes closed today, you're here, and, and you're just going through a, you know, some of the things I spoke about today. They, they're, they're, they, they spoke to you. They, 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 uh, they spoke about your past and your life and the things that you've been through. And, and uh, you're just going to be honest today. You're going to say, you know what? I am a bitter person. I had this event happen to me, and it hurt. Unfortunately, I've absorbed the rage. I've absorbed the anger. I've, I've produced this fruit in my life that I don't like, this fruit that, that affects people around me, this fruit that, that hurts people, even though I don't want to do that, this, this fruit that causes people to kind of grow distant to me because, because I'm not dealing with it. And so I find myself at a, at a place of pain. You're here this morning, and that's you. You're here, and you're just struggling in life, struggling with this ghost of bitterness. I'm here to tell you, you can find peace today. Some of you, the, the, the peace will cause healing and it'll be instantaneous, supernatural healing. And, and yet others of you, you're going to go on a long journey. You're going to go on a journey that God's going to bring you through and he's going he's to challenge you. He's going to strengthen you up and he's going to do something miraculous in your life like you've never known. But, but all he's asking you to do is just walk with him and trust him along the journey. With your head bowed and eyes closed and just between you and the Holy Spirit right here, right now, would you just bow your heads and just say these words? Just say, okay, God, hmm. I don't like to admit it, but I'm bitter. I don't like to confess, but I know I've, I've been hurt. And because of that pain, I, as a result, have hurt others. So right here, Holy Spirit, first off, forgive me. Forgive me and help me to find healing in you. I ask you, say this, I ask you, Holy Spirit, take me on the journey of healing. Come through my garden and pull up those bitter roots and replace them with your incredible fruit. I need you, Holy Spirit, to guide me and direct me and help me to recognize the things that I don't realize that I'm bitter about. Help me to recognize my anger. Help me to recognize these areas. And most importantly, help me to replace them with the fruit of the Spirit. I need you, God, to be my strength, to be my hope. You're all I have. Say that. You're all I have. <laughs> you are my source. Thank you, God. Those of you here today, as you continue to pray, those of you here today, I just feel like I need just extend an, an invitation to you. There's those of you here today that you're not walking with God, you're far from God. In fact, today you're here and you need peace in your life, but you don't know how to get it. 
Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Today, you have a reason to have peace and hope. It's only through Christ and through Christ alone. You say, well, I don't deserve it. You don't know what, you don't know where I've been. You don't know what I've done. No, I don't, but he does. And guess what? He still loves you anyway. There's no shame. There's nothing for you to be embarrassed about except to bring all your burdens to him and he'll accept you as you are. He won't leave you as you are, but he will accept you as you are. You're here this morning. You need to surrender your life to Christ. You need to surrender everything you are to the hope of Jesus Christ. Would you right there where you're at, just bow your heads and say this prayer. Say, here I am, God, just as I am. Forgive me. Forgive me for my sins and help me to walk with you every day. I need you, God. I need your strength. I need your hope. Guide my steps. In Jesus' name, I ask. Amen. God, deep subjects, deep waters to walk through, but God, ones you want us to heal from. As we learn how to overcome the ghost of offense, the ghost of shame, the ghost of bitterness, God, this Christmas season may be the best season ever because, God, we're on a path of healing. We're on a path of, of, of getting the ghost out of our lives and having the fullness of what the Christmas season is all about. For unto us, in the city of David, a child is born, and he will be called Emmanuel, which is God with us. Thank you, God, for all of your blessings. In Jesus' name, amen.